it seemed to me that it would be especially appropriate today uh, for me to speak about the elections and its consequences or potential impact on uh, cities in the United States, uh, particularly um, from a policy point of view. So I wanna kind of give us some context and then uh, examine uh, some of the policy implications of this election. Um, but I thought it would be important for everybody to understand a few things about American politics and elections uh, before I begin and also to go over some of the results of this election, this extraordinary election that we've not even done with yet. So um, the first real question for us will be to address whether or not a Biden administration will actually make a difference in urban policy. And I ask that question because the federal government in the United States has been increasingly disconnected in some ways from cities uh, insofar as aid to cities directly from the federal government has actually been decreasing since uh, 1979. So if you look at the fiscal impact of federal policy as one indicator, um, you'll be somewhat disappointed, to be honest, in terms of what federal government is actually doing for cities right now in the United States. Um, having said that, this is an election that will have consequences. And, I, and again, you know, is that, is that a point to be made? Well, in American politics, historically, often people looked at presidential elections as not really being able to move the needle significantly in policy. Basically, people saw the two parties being very, very similar in terms of their approach to public policy. There is absolutely no question now, after four years of Donald Trump, that having a Democratic Party uh, president will definitely make a difference in public policy. Elections have consequences. Uh, there's no question about that. And we want to look at this election in terms of its mandate. In American politics, it's very important to understand that um, the outcome of an election potentially creates a mandate for the president to change public policy. And if the election is viewed as illegitimate, which of course what's happening right now, President Trump is trying to cast aspersions on the legitimacy of this election by claiming all kinds of voter fraud without any evidence, um, that could potentially hurt the, uh, a president-elect Biden's ability uh, to implement his policy agenda. Um, this is this idea of a mandate uh, is actually very important. Public opinion is very important in this context. And why will it be really, really important in this election? Is because the outcome of this election is likely to produce a divided government. There's always what we call structural considerations to take into account. You have a presidential uh, candidate, a president-elect now, who clearly had a different has a different policy agenda than the current president. But, uh, but will he be able to implement it? This is not uh, a parliamentary system. The presidential system allows for the possibility that the legislature and the executive will come from different parties. Um, and in fact, there will be two runoffs in, for Senate seats in Georgia, which will determine which party ultimately has the majority in the Senate. And um, right now, the Republicans are favored. So the potential outcome, however, of, this, of that Senate race uh, could really dramatically impact what this president could, can get done through legislation. Um, 
And then the other really important structural aspect of this election is that this wasn't just a presidential election. We had elections, what we call down the ballot for governors, state legislatures, you know, local governments as well. Uh, we are a federalist system. And what we are seeing is Republican governors are continuing uh, to win and to ha have a majority in many states across the United States. And we look, when we look at policy, a lot of federal policy that impacts cities goes through the state governments. And so there's a, an opportunity for governors to sort of direct the aid in particular kinds of ways. So not, not a lot of it goes directly to cities, of course, which cities which are primarily democratic. So there's a lot to take in about what happened, but this context, I think, is very important for you to bear in mind. Yes, this election definitely has consequences for public policy. Um, as we'll see, there is a mandate. There's a very specific mandate from the public about where they want uh, this president to go and what were the issues which really motivated their vote choices. Um, we are likely to have some form of divided government and uh, we continue to, to have to work within a federalist system where state governments are dominated by Republicans and city governments will be dominated by Democrats. Okay, um, if that isn't enough, let me try and break down for you quickly what I think are some of the important outcomes from this election as it relates to um, urban policy and the situation of cities. And just because the president is continuing to dispute the outcomes of, a, of this election, it's very important to say up front right now that the first fact that has to be acknowledged is that Joe Biden defeated Donald Trump. There is virtually no way, given the margin of vict victories and the Electoral College, that even after a recount in Georgia that Trump could possibly win this election. Um, the, and this is because uh, the margin of the popular vote and the margin of the electoral college vote. So for those of you who are tuning in from different countries, you're probably not that familiar with this thing called the electoral college. Unfortunately, uh, we still have this in the United States. It is actually a way of diluting the impact of the popular vote. Um, and uh, basically we create uh, electors who then vote for the president. The, elect, the number of electors are, are, are based on uh, the size of the congressional delegation. And so what we find is that because we have a Senate and a House, States with smaller populations have a disproportionate impact through the Electoral College. So here we are, um, and it has to be said clearly that Trump has lost the Electoral College vote. We, in order to win, you need 270 votes. That's the threshold. Um, 538 is the total number of electoral college votes. So we do not have the final count in, in yet, but we currently know that Biden has 290 electoral college votes, which doesn't include Georgia, which is expected to go to Biden. So as I said, there is no path for victory <clears throat> for President Trump. The second point, which I think is very important, is that Biden actually won the popular vote. So even though you don't win the presidency, ultimately from the popular vote, the mandate that I was talking about uh, really comes primarily from the popular vote. This, this, uh, this is a situation where Biden right now in the count has 
50.9% of the popular vote. Trump has 47.5% of the popular vote. Uh, Biden received over 77.4 million votes and Trump received over 72.3 million votes. Now, importantly, what changed from 2016 is not the popular vote. It's important to keep in mind that Hillary Clinton actually beat Trump in the popular vote. Uh, Clinton received 48% of the popular vote to Trump's 45.9%, but of course she lost in the electoral college. <clears throat> and so what did Biden do to win? And this is very important also from the perspective of how cities will be treated by a Trump by a Biden presidency as compared to how they were treated by, the Trump, uh, by Trump's presidency. Biden was able to fit, flip three traditionally democratic states, Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania, uh, which Hillary Clinton had lost. And this also is by close margins. So, you know, the one takeaway from this election is that there is still um, a great divide in the United States right now. But if we look very closely at this divide, um, we may find actually that the uh, country has a lot more in common uh, than people might think. So before I get into the specific urban policy issues that might change, I think it's important to stick with this point about the mandate from, from the public and look at what were the issues that seemed to be most important in motivating the public uh, in this election. So <clears throat> there are a lot of issues that informed vote, inform vote choice. And it's important to bear in mind that when you look at those public opinion polls, people tell you what they think, but it doesn't mean that those are the that are going to inform how they vote. So what we know historically is that the public tends to vote around economic issues and not just how the economy is doing, but their own personal perception of whether they are doing well uh, economically. And in this race, there seem to be uh, a lot more issues that were informing people's vote choice. And just in the exit polls, we, we find something very important. When people were asked what was the most important issue, the number one issue that affected their vote, 35% of voters did say it was the economy driving their vote. <clears throat> so that remains the top issue. But 20% of voters said it was racial equality and 17% 17, 17 of voters said it was the COVID pandemic. <clears throat> so here is, you know, something important for us to understand. The voters who cited racial inequality, and remember that's 20% of the voters, they broke 90% for Joe Biden. And the voters that cited the pandemic they broke 81% for, for Biden. And uh, the other most important thing to understand is that the exit polls also reveal that 52% of voters said it was more important to contain the virus now, even if it hurts the economy. And they broke 79% for Biden. So these margin of victories come from very clear places. Uh, and if we look at the demographics, which I won't go into in great detail, but I think it's, it's important uh, as we try and understand where the vote majority came from for Biden, uh, you know, the cities vote Democratic, and that's the bottom line here, but are they an important or a substantial group of voters. So what we know, if we look at the population in terms of where they live, cities of 50,000 or more, suburbs, 
for small cities and rural areas, the breakdown is really interesting. 29% of voters come from cities of 50,000 and more. 51% come from suburbs outside the central cities. And only 19% of voters come from small towns and uh, rural areas. And within the cities of 50,000 or more, 60% of voters broke for Biden, 30% for Trump. In the suburban areas, 50% went to Biden, which is a change, and 48% went to Trump. And of course, the margin of victory in the small, small cities and rural areas goes to Trump, 57 to 42. But that only constituted 19% of the popular vote. So it's important to keep in mind when you're looking for the mandate, you're looking at the popular vote. And cities are important in this and the suburban areas, which of course are key, um, by small margins this time around went to Biden. And the other, the other I think important point uh, to look at has to do with the change in um, vote by uh, race and ethnicity, which is to say white voters still make up 67% of the electorate, which is significant. Uh, this time, uh, Biden received 41% of the white vote. He increased his margin of white voters relative to Hillary Clinton, even though he lost the white vote. Black voters make up 13% of the electorate. They broke 87% for Biden. Hispanic vote voters make up 13% of the electorate. They, vote, they broke 65% for Biden, which actually was a decline in the percentage of black of uh, Hispanic voters that went to the Democratic candidate. And 4% of the electorate are Asian and they went 61% uh, for Biden. So if you combine the idea that the majority of city voters went for Biden and that disproportionate numbers of minorities actually live in cities, we get a sense of um, where the policy direction is coming from the Democratic Party and from the Biden and where it will come from the Biden administration. So let's jump to policy quickly and, and talk about some of the things that Biden has proposed and uh, what he will do differently that will actually uh, impact cities. And, and this is very important because, you know, I pointed out to you that we still might have a Republican Senate. So some of this will not be able to be done through legislation, but some of it will also be able to be done through executive order. So what a president-elect Biden will have to do is also not simply to implement his own agenda, but actually he's going to have to undo significant changes that the Trump administration have put into place that have had terrible and adverse impacts on cities. And I like to call this as undoing the damage, right? So, <coughs> excuse me. So let's just go through a couple of policy areas uh, and then, then I'll take questions. So what does uh, undoing the damage mean? First, COVID-19 and the pandemic. Um, we do not have a national policy right now uh, to combat the pandemic. This is not just an urban problem, but of course cities have been disproportionately affected by this because minority populations have been disproportionately affected by the um, COVID-19 virus. So um, any form of federal aid that will offset the costs related to the pandemic that cities and, and their state governments have uh, been shouldering right now will be significant assistance first of all, but second of all, and just as important, is having a national policy 
will allow us hopefully to tamp down this pandemic sooner and to start rebuilding the economy um, from the devastating effects of COVID-19. And this is where we see such an important role for the federal government uh, to be playing. We're, we've been waiting for a stimulus package and one of the requests that the Democratic pre uh, elect president is supporting is increased aid uh, to state and local governments. Every single city in this country is experiencing a fiscal crisis right now, meaning they cannot balance their budget. The decline in the economy has impacted the collection of tax revenues. So uh, cities do, do not have enough money to provide basic services, let alone to address uh, the public health crisis. New York City alone is, uh, is facing a $9 billion deficit. And at the same time, the Trump administration has actually threatened to pull $12 billion of non-COVID federal aid. Um, this is quite extraordinary. Uh, this comes from uh, this, this policy that uh, Trump has tried to put into place, uh, labeling cities anarchist jurisdictions. New York City, Seattle, and Portland were labeled anarchist jurisdictions. And as a consequence, the Trump administration has suggested that they are allowed uh, to reduce federal aid because the cities are, are not doing their job providing law and order. Um, this is kind of mind reeling. It's in court, of course, and Trump hasn't managed to pull that one off yet, but that is in the, that that is on the dockets. Obviously, that would be something that would be immediately um, rescinded by the Biden administration. Um, so, in this con in this context, uh, Biden would be providing aid to state and local governments directly so that that would enable them to reduce their budget deficits, not cut back on services and, and be able to support um, the need of populations which are now being disproportionately impacted by COVID as well as uh, economic decline, which is of course the unemployment rates in cities are high. Um, we do not now have in place uh, an additional um, stimulus package which would help uh, those who are on unemployment. We do not have anything in place which can, would continue to help small businesses. So um, we're not, without, without the Biden administration coming into power, we would be continuing to see a disproportionate negative impact on cities in these most fundamental areas of federal aid around, around the economy, as well as around public health and um, COVID-19. The other very important thing for cities uh, was the policy put into place by Trump, and this may sound esoteric, but it's very important. Um, traditionally, if you lived in a city, you were allowed to duck, deduct your state and local taxes from your federal income tax before you paid your federal, from your income rather, before you paid your federal income tax. Uh, this is very important because it sort of was a double jeopardy situation for cities. Basically, the burden on cities uh, residents in terms of taxing was kind of compounded. So if you lived in cities, you paid your uh, tax, your, in your tax directly to the, a certain amount of tax directly to state governments and city governments, but that was taxed again that income for the purposes of paying your, uh, that tax rather was taxed again for the purposes of paying your federal tax. Um, 
that would be rescinded under a Biden administration, and that is particularly important from a fiscal point of view. Um, Trump immigration policies, you know, this could take up our whole hour. I'll only say that um, in a place like New York City, where 38% of the population are immigrants and 45% of the workforce are immigrants, um, they are under assault by the Trump administration. And so basically under a Biden administration, uh, cities which sort of created sanctuaries for immigrants would not uh, there would be no effort by the federal government to penalize them. But more importantly, Biden has articulated a road to citizenship. And of course, he would put, uh, he would once again uh, create, uh, put the DACA uh, back into place that President Biden, uh, that President Obama uh, had made policy um, so that deportation of young people who have lived here their whole lives would then stop. On a couple of other areas, it's really important, funding of transportation infrastructure. Um, Trump was supposed to have this great big infrastructure plan. It never really happened. But not only did he not fund infrastructure through the federal government, he's basically held up projects based on, you know, whether you're a city and you're a so-called blue state, which is you voted Democratic. So again, using New York as an example, we have a number of projects which were uh, held up here, which had been already on the drawing boards. Uh, one of the tunnels, which are critical um, to the economy of the country, let alone the Northeastern Corridor, uh, has been held up. Um, and um, this is a particularly important project uh, for economic recovery. And of course, on climate change, um, you know, cities have been trying to hold the line on climate change policy and, and reducing our carbon emissions. Of course, it, it's very difficult when you have a national policy that essentially tries to penalize cities and states. Um, which are trying to support clean energy and reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, this would, you know, not only would Trump return us to the Paris Climate Accords, um, but he would support the efforts to create um, renewable energy and renewable energy jobs and stop subsidizing the oil industry. And Again, this is also extremely important to cities as it is to the rest of the country, but especially in cities which have been, you know, working without the support of the federal government to, to try and mitigate the impacts of climate change. And, you know, the final thing here, of course, uh, I, I just want to touch upon uh, race and social justice. Um, there is criminal justice uh, policy now and policy toward policing where the Trump administration has intentionally decided to try and sow racial division in this country, um, as well as an approach that um, has made an effort to pit city against suburb. The, 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 uh, the kinds of commercials that Trump ran during the campaign, uh, the, the law and order commercials, uh, the Democrats are, are coming to put low income housing projects in your suburb. This has been a, a targeted effort to isolate cities from suburbs, especially to, to a split suburban white voters away from uh, minority and urban voters. Um, the rhetoric is important. There have been some efforts, of course, by Trump to make policy out of this. This will stop under a Biden administration and uh, approaching policy 
by looking for commonalities between cities and suburbs is really important. Um, we have a nation that while we're urban, um, we're also suburban. And there are differences between the inner ring suburbs and the outer ring suburbs. But the challenge, you know, the challenge is really uh, important here to make people understand that our nation can only succeed um, when we do not look for divisions, but look for commonalities. So I think ultimately, when we think about what the Biden administration will be doing around public policy, he will be taking the mandate of his election to create policies which in fact um, make Americans view themselves as they say, not as blue and red states or blue and red communities, but rather as um, Americans. And this is a not to be underestimated. The only way he will succeed in getting his policy agenda through is by convincing senators from the Republican Party that it is no longer in their interest to fan the flames of division, but rather the kind of coalition that Biden created is really the coalition of the future. It's the only way to win elections and that the policies must reflect that. Um, so that is the agenda. These are some of the constraints or possible challenges for a Trump administration, um, but there's no question that this election um, will make a difference for America and especially make a difference for American cities. Okay, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, Professor Fuchs. That was uh, pretty insightful. Um, and we, we did get a few questions while you were talking. I'll start with the first one. Um, this one comes from Joe. So Joe wants to know, with state and local budgets under extreme stress due to the coronavirus pandemic and federal assistance looking increasingly unlikely at least until January, what measures should local officials take to minimize job losses and cuts to services? Should local policymakers consider tax increases to offset the lost revenue? even when that could mean some of their constituents might leave because of the tax hikes? Well, that is a great question. And uh, Joe, uh, I've spent a good portion of my both uh, academic and public service life on the question of budgets and wrote a book called Mayors and Money. Um, and there is, we are in a serious fiscal crisis right now. Every city in the country is confronting these choices that you are saying and the truth of course is is that even when cities do get the stimulus money directly to state and local governments um, from a biden administration and hopefully it will be sooner in in late january um, that will not be sufficient to offset the decline in revenues that's come from this uh this uh pandemic induced economic recession so, you know, each city has to make these decisions on the basis of um, what their tax base is and who, where the needs are. There's a couple of rules of thumb that I would put into place as we think about this. It is very important that cities not uh, cut the guts at basic service delivery. And what do I mean by that? Which is to say, uh, traditionally, you know, cities cut headcount uh, and they don't raise taxes that much because partly because they don't have the legal authority to raise taxes. They have to go to the state legislature most often, even when there's home rule, to and to the governor, of course, to increase their taxing authority. So for the sit Democratic cities with Republican governors or Republican state legislatures, it's an added burden to try and find revenues through increasing taxes. And they may not even have, have the choices. So you can either cut spending, borrow, uh, look for other sources of revenues through fees and through um, 
po possibly getting revenues from other levels of government. And then, you know, you can uh, increase taxes. Clearly, what has to happen for cities now is a mix of cutting spending and increasing tax revenues and fees and even a certain amount of borrowing. I don't support high levels of borrowing because basically it just, it just uh, devastates the next, the future uh, capacity of cities because you have to pay interest on debt. And so at a time in which your revenues are declining, you're creating more fixed costs for yourself and you can't put that money into service delivery. So one of the most difficult things to do politically that needs to be on the table is if you're not going to reduce headcount dramatically, you also have to be able to reduce the costs of municipal employees, which means going into the contracts and collective bargaining agreements and seeing where savings could be made. They don't have to be permanent or they could be. In some instances, uh, cities are very, very uh, impacted by the costs of the pension funds. Many cities pay more money to municipal employees who are retired than those who are actually working in this working right now. So um, I think some hard decisions have to be made by city government. And critically, the idea of cutting basic services to me is really problematic. Um, Businesses can leave, middle-class taxpayers can leave cities, and to the extent they choose to leave, it reduces the tax base and creates long-term fiscal burdens. And so if you wanna do any kind of social services or redistribution in cities, you need a tax base. So I think that cities have to bite the bullet right now and start those kinds of uh, cuts that I have articulated, as well as going to the state legislatures for some tax increases. And uh, I think it's really important for high earners to contribute their fair share now. I also think commuter taxes are in line now. Um, but these are hard political lifts to get done for cities. But during crisis, a lot can happen. And uh, Somebody smarter than me said, crisis are a terrible thing to waste. So this is an opportunity to restructure finances in cities a bit, to get them more under control, more aligned with the reality of what's going on, and make sure that there's revenues to do the kinds of social service spending that a lot of city governments want to engage in. So I hope that helps, Joe. Thank you. We have another question from Jessica. Could you please talk about how Biden's plans on renewable energy and climate change would, on the other hand, affect cities whose economies are largely based on heavily polluted industries? How should the Biden administration strive for a balance? So the one thing that they have said, and that is a very fair question, and this has been the crux of, you know, a lot of public policy for a long time, which is, Many people work in sort of dirty industries and um, non-renewables like the oil industry. A, a lot of that is in some of the Southwest cities. Um, and the impact on individuals will be devastating if there's no public policy to um, support them. And the impact on businesses will be devastating if there's no public policy to support them. And in, in fact, I think uh, there's lessons to be learned from the mistakes that were made, you know, when NAFTA was put into place and, and the Clinton administration said, oh, you know, uh, the, the, the clean jobs are going to stay here and every, and we're going to, people will retrain and go into those jobs and we're just going to lose some of those manufacturing jobs that we don't really want anyway. Well, like that did not happen. And the big failures I would say are in two places. To support gradually, first of all, it has to be gradual. And I don't mean slow, slow, but I mean gradual so that the impact is not devastating all at once when we do this shift to renewable energy. And that Biden articulated very clearly 
So when he said we should stop subsidizing oil, uh, he also said um, that you that we needed to um, also do this at a pace, you know, that doesn't uh, devastate people who work in this industry. So the pace is very important. The support is very important that comes from the federal government in terms of unwinding these industries and investing in renewables. At the same time, job training and placement is key to the success of, of these kinds of changes for the people who will be impacted. And this is why, you know, you don't get support in even the rural, you know, the coal rural areas from the people who work there who are being whose health conditions are being devastated by the working in coal mines because they don't see other economic opportunities for themselves. So this has been a big failure of the Democratic Party. Biden has articulated policies that would support the kinds of job training that are required in a transition. When I was in the Bloomberg administration, I restructured workforce development or job training and found the federal policy to be very inadequate it's very it's not just that it's underfunded but we don't have um, the infrastructure in place the capacity to do effective job training and placement for the so-called 21st century uh, low carb low carbon impact jobs uh, we have more models now out there that could be used but we're not funding them so I think this is where the administration's feet has to be held to the fire, so to speak, and that there has to be support for this kind of workforce development for displaced workers. And there also has to be support for the industries which are gonna be unwinding um, at the same time that we support the renewables. Because you know we know that certain regions are very much dependent on these kinds of jobs. And if we want, to create a green economy, uh, we've got to help people transition out of this, you know, out of our dirty economy. Um, and if we don't, they are not going to support uh, the Democratic Party or 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 uh, the Democratic Party candidates who support um, the green economy. Thank you, um, Professor Fuchs. You touched on the structural challenges of a divided government. Uh, the Democratic Party is at an enormous disadvantage due to Senate malapportionment overweighting smaller, more rural states. Statehood for Washington, D.C. and Puerto Rico would help, but are there state and local policies that can be pursued to entice populations to move to counterbalance the skewed Senate? <laughs> oh, that is such an interesting question. Um, what's happening, I think, you know, I don't really. To be honest, I don't think trying to entice people to move to the more rural states is a solution here. Um, I do think giving statehood to DC and Puerto Rico is something within the context of our representative democracy should be done, period, regardless of whether it will have an impact on the Electoral College and the Senate. So um, they, they sh deserve representation. And, you know, in Puerto Rico, it's more complicated of, you know, whether or not they really want to be a state, but certainly DC should be, it's, 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 uh, it's long, long overdue. Um, so what you're pointing to is the sort of fundamental structural problem in our system right now, because the Senate and the Electoral College are constitutional, so we would, to, to create a constitutional amendment would require the approval of those states, some of those states which benefit from the current distribution of power. So I really think that the demographic progressions right now will be changing things. And to the extent that we invest, for example, in green energy and in education, uh, in those states as well, as the Democratic Party can do this, um, the views of these states will potentially be different. They were not always Republican, okay? Moreover, um, 
these states, because of the nature of work, have also increased immigration. Also, um, young people in these states have often different views than the older people. So there are divisions that could be exploited by the Democratic Party, increased immigration, the youth population, um, even the elderly have a stake in the kinds of programs uh, uh, that Biden has supported, the Affordable Care Act, protecting uh, Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security. So part of it is that uphill education battle about, about um, who's representing your interests better. And um, I think we have to do a better job on that, as difficult as it may be. But also, I really think the, that ultimately the demographic shifts will allow for a constitutional amendment, at least, which will get rid of the Electoral College. The Senate uh, is so historically entrenched, uh, I have to say I really am not sure uh, how that will work. And so I think that the Democrats have to fight hot, harder for the populations in these states that don't view their interests being represented by the Democratic Party. Thank you. Um, we have another question uh, more on the Biden-Harris administration. Can you please talk about how this administration will have to spend a lot of time convincing Republican senators that it is in their best interest to work together and not continuing fanning the divide? The U.S. seems so divided, and in what ways do you think that this administration will be successful in this? Uh, you know, that is a very difficult question, and but it's most important question because that is what's going to happen. There's two things that you have to bear in mind in terms of the change of public policy. One will happen through, leg through the legislation, obviously, and then you, you know, need the Senate or everybody stops, right? The other is through executive order. And so there is going to be a lot that Biden can do through executive order, primarily to begin with rescinding many of Trump's executive orders, right? Especially around immigration and environmental protection and actually health and safety. Um, and and um, the, it's a, sort of been an extraordinarily dismantling of the uh, uh, federal oversight apparatus and of our regulatory state um, that the Trump administration has been engaging in that has to be turned around dramatically and quickly. And so not all the action is going to be on the legislative side. There will be all of this work that has to be done within the federal bu bureaucracy and what we call the regulatory state and through executive orders. Now, Here's, you know, ultimately, the Republican Party is going to have to decide, you know, what direction it's taking its future. Is it going to continue hitching its star to a Republican, uh, you know, a Republicanism that has been labeled Trumpism? Or is it going to try to find some common ground with the Democrats so at least some legislation can be passed. You know, we know from the Obama administration that a lot, this was an obstructionist Senate at that time under Mitch McConnell. And, the, and so I think we are in different times now, this sort of post, uh, it's not post COVID yet, we are in the middle of the COVID pandemic and, the, and a second surge. And more and more people are dying and that impacts red states and blue states, that will impact, you know, and they can be in denial as much as they want, but people see with their eyes now, finally, the, the impact of a failed federal government and a failure on the part of the Senate uh, uh, to act. And once the Biden administration puts an agenda on the table around two things, the economic stimulus and public health, I think there, the the even if the Senate is Republican, it will only be a uh, 52-48 split. This is not a big majority, okay? So I think that um, they also will be forced to act in these two big areas. B 
beyond that, I won't take any bets, you know. Um, I think it's, it's going to be much more complicated to get any comprehensive immigration policy through um, or any kind of comprehensive uh, uh, change in the social service system. I think those will be more difficult. But these big pieces of the puzzle, which have to be done now, uh, I think there will be an opportunity um, uh, for bipartisanship on that. So, you know, that's the half glass half full or half empty. This is not easy. What you point out is what we know, which is the country is split right now. The question is really within that split, where are the commonalities and what can be turned into legislation that really benefits the whole country? And will the Republicans see it in their interests to um, work on issues that everybody wins from? Uh, in the past, that's been a path. Um, again, it's going to be hard to tell what they're going to do, but I think that will happen around the COVID uh, pandemic and a, an economic stimulus package. Thank you. We have just a few minutes left, so I think we can uh, answer one more question. Um, this one comes from, from Caroline. Thank you, Caroline, for your question. Um, when Obama was elected in 2008, he could say his mandate was affordable health care because that is what people said was most important to them. While polling proves certain issues like COVID-19 and climate change influenced voters to vote for Biden, do you think the broader narrative that voting for Biden was simply a vote against Trump could hurt his ability to say he was voted for on a specific mandate like climate change, even though he said he was? Um, I don't, you know, that's a very good question. Actually, you know, in the polls at least, you have to distinguish between the narrative of the po of uh, of the campaign and what people actually said in the polls. And you know what what I found when you look at the polls and people were asked what is the most important inch issue driving their vote. Um, 35% said it was the economy, 20% of voters said it was racial equality, and 17% said it was the COVID pandemic. So I think that there is a mandate for Biden to act around the, in those three areas. The public wants him to act in general around, and certainly his voters want him to, but Broadly, the public wants him to act in those three areas. Um, and uh, so climate change is something that people have strong opinions about, but ironically, it's not a driver for the presidential vote choice. It's not the first issue. It may come up second or third or something like that, but it's generally not the first issue. It did not rank at all. Uh, what was really interesting about this race is what ranked was, you know, racial justice and COVID. So that's really, um, and of course the economy. So that's really my takeaway uh, from the public opinion data. All right, so we are, um about to conclude. Uh, Professor Fuchs, thank you so much, um, you know, for this talk and, and for answering these questions. If, uh, if attendees want to learn more about the work that you do and the urban and social policy concentration, what other ways can they remain connected with us during this time? Okay, so this is great. First of all, you can email me or my, uh, my program assistant, uh, Kevin Gully. And uh, Kathleen, you can put those emails right in the chat. Or the three student PAs, uh, the two student PAs rather that we have now, Jessica Hernandez and, and um, Emma Troxler. It's always great to talk to students uh, and find out what they think and what they know. Um, this is the, and you of course can go to the website. We have tons of information on the website. And I, I would say for those of you who are interested in <clears throat> urban and social policy, and I'm gonna say this 
straight out. I don't think there's a better public policy school in the country, probably in the globe, uh, to come to than Columbia SIPA. And it's not that there are not other good schools out there. There are, and they do a lot of things really well. And in fact, they do some things better than we do. But for urban policy, being in New York, being at Columbia and being at SIPA is the best possible choice you can make. We take it seriously. We take urban issues seriously. We have an incredible array of courses, research opportunities, as well as uh, student organizations interested in uh, social justice, um, economic, entrepre social entrepreneurship, um, civic engagement, and we have New York as our laboratory. Uh, so many of faculty do research here, but also you have the opportunity to work in New York City government in your internship, as well as with community-based organizations. We've added four new courses to USP for the spring, which I know we'll be continuing to have. One is on community engagement with the uh, with the executive director of the 125th Street Business Improvement District in Harlem, who is going to be doing a, a workshop for us. Um, I'm really excited about, about this. And um, we have our capstone workshops, which many of them are in New York. And um, the feedback from students is always extraordinary. And the work that we do gets actually transformed into policy fairly quickly in a lot of instances. So um, yes, I'm pitching, but um, I say this with a straight face and with all candor, and I'll, I'll, I'll say this in the context with any representative from any other policy uh, school in the country or on in the globe. Uh, SEPA, Columbia, New York City, it's an unbeatable combination. And I hope you come. Amazing. Thank you so much, Professor Fuchs. Um, this has been a wonderful discussion. And thank you all for those of you who attended. Um, you know, thank you for, for your interest and for remaining connected with us during this time. If you have any questions for our admissions team, I'm also going to leave our email. Feel free to uh, connect with us at any moment and enjoy the rest of your Friday. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you're coming from. Bye. Bye. Thank you.